Have you ever missed a chance you wish you would have taken? Something that might have yielded amazing results if you'd simply have taken the leap. Unfortunately, due to an array of circumstances, this can happen to us as a species. Imagine for a moment what might have happened if Heron of Alexandria had realized that his steam toy was in fact a rudimentary steam engine. Given that the steam engine played a major role in the dawn of our industrial and ultimately technological age, what might have happened if we'd hit on it thousands of years before we did? Might we have set foot on the moon and Mars centuries ago? That's a question for what if history, but in another instance it's not so much of a stretch to understand what might have happened. This was the hiatus NASA took after the end of the Apollo program from manned exploration of the solar system's moons and planets. The natural next step after the moon landing was putting a man on Mars. Had Apollo continued and our sights kept firmly on Mars, we would live in a very different world right now, where Mars would either be our oyster and colonization would be happening now, or conversely, we might have went and then abandoned Mars, much like we did with the moon. Thankfully, that era of our species spending its time in lower Earth orbit now seems over. Not only is NASA setting its sights on the moon and Mars, once again with their space launch system heavy lift rocket, we also have SpaceX, whose stated end game is founding a full-on colony on Mars, where thousands of people or more may live. And their time frame is aggressive. The foundation of this colony could begin in the mid to late 2020s. And they're actively building their own heavy lift rocket, the BFR, for this purpose. But it has far more uses than merely colonizing Mars. This system could be used to colonize much of the solar system, and at the same time revolutionize the long-haul transport of humans and goods here on Earth. Think rockets instead of aircraft. My guest today has been tenaciously advocating the exploration of Mars for decades all through that long period of inaction, even formulating a method where we could have gotten to Mars economically and realistically years ago. But for better or worse, a new age is dawning where it now seems inevitable that humanity will stretch its wings and explore our solar system. It's going to be an amazing thing to watch unfold, perhaps the most amazing period yet in human history. Mars, here we come. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. John today is Dr. Robert Zubrin, aerospace engineer, inventor, and founder of the Mars Society, an organization dedicated to the human exploration of Mars. Dr. Zubrin has authored numerous books, including The Case for Mars, Merchants of Despair, and even a science fiction novel, First Landing, which imagines the possibilities of colonizing Mars. Dr. Zubrin, welcome to the program. Thanks for inviting me. Now, Doctor, you, um, you've been involved with advocacy regarding um, the expo human exploration of Mars for decades. Uh, you founded the Mars Society. You wrote The Case for Mars many years ago. Um, what, is the, what is the end game? What do you want to just uh, humans to explore Mars and come home, or do you want to colonize it and terraform it at some point? What, what, what do you see as the the human future for Mars? Uh, I want Mars to be, become the home of a new branch of possibly several new branches of human civilization. I want Mars, the, the venture of expanding uh, the human uh, frontier to Mars to be something that draws at least the best parts of humanity together on this planet. So we go together to Mars and I want Mars then to become a vibrant new branch of human civilization that will join with Earth in taking us further out. So it's together to Mars and then together with Mars. Mars, you know, some people say, well, we should go to Mars because the Earth is dying. Well, the Earth isn't dying. And if it was, the answer would not be for a few people to escape to Mars. Okay. Rather, what we need to do is to go to Mars to further establish the terrifically creative nature of the human species that we can take barren places and turn them into new homes for life and civilization that become engines for progress themselves. You know, the, the greatest benefit that Europeans got out of the new world was not the gold that the Aztecs 
were deprived of by the Spaniards or exports of cotton or tobacco from North America to Britain and Europe. It was rather that they created a, a, a terrific new branch of Western civilization that, you know, invented democracy and steamboats and telegraphs and light bulbs and centrally generated electric power and aeroplanes and computers and nuclear power and the internet. You know, that in the game of life, the score is is made by uh, having children. And, and as it were, I... I I want us to give birth to a new child, a new branch of human civilization, maybe several new branches of human civilization on uh, on Mars. So in essence, Mars would, by colonizing Mars, you drive human innovation, essentially. Yes, we drive human innovation and we also refute the contention, the very dangerous contention, and I, I know that you're interested in discussing this as well, that there's only so much to go around. And so uh, human activities and numbers and liberties need to be limited. And all nations are ultimately enemies because we have to see who gets the, the last piece of the pie. Instead, what we're doing in this, this is a tremendous demonstration of the power of the human spirit. You know, uh, Johann Roebling, the visionary engineer who created the, the Brooklyn Bridge, which was the first suspension bridge of anything like that size. And I said, no one will be able to look on it, and not be prouder to be a man. Well, no one will be able to look at a terraform Mars and not be prouder to be human. Oh, absolutely. How long do you think it would terraform Mars? You know, how long would that take before it's actually an Earth-like planet that we can maintain as, you know, a true home for humanity, a second home? How, how, what's your time frame for that? Well, you see, if you do it the way I would do it, which is to first, you know, set up human settlements on Mars, then set up industries that produce artificial greenhouse gases like uh, a fluorocarbon gases that are tremendously powerful greenhousing things that would warm the planet for CO2 to outgas from the soil, which would warm it more and thicken the atmosphere. And then water starts melting and flowing. And, and then you can start planting plants and spread them all over the planet and making oxygen. If you did it that way, we're talking time frames of a thousand years. But here's the thing. I'm a 20th century engineer. I was born in 1952. I'm sitting in an office right now. I can still see my slide rule in the corner. Okay. And here I am grappling with a 22nd century problem. And right. so I'm kind of in the position of Jules Verne talking about how to go to the moon. You know, in 1860s, uh, Jules Verne wrote a novel from the earth to the moon. Yes. And uh, there was a lot of parts of it that are extremely realistic. They launched from Florida. And, and Verne understood why Americans would want to launch from Florida. And they orbited the moon and it was a crew of three and they flew in a capsule and they landed in the Pacific Ocean and were picked up by a United States Navy warship, all as actually happened in the uh, real Apollo missions a hundred years later. But the form of propulsion that they used was heavy artillery. And you look at that and say, flying to the moon, being fired there by heavy artillery, how 19th century can you get? Well, I think that Mars will be terraformed and not a thousand years from now, but a, a few hundred years from now. And I think that if people on Mars in the year 2300 were to pick up a copy of my book, The Case for Mars, and read it, they would say, this is remarkable. Here's this guy writing in the late 20th century saying we're going to terraform Mars, but doing it with fluorocarbon gases and green plants. How 20th century can you get? In other words, the forms of technology that will actually do this are those that are beyond our own horizon. You know, maybe it'll be nanotechnology or something. Things that for me to talk about today would really be talking about what is to us magic, okay? But the fact that I can outline a plan, which is doable, albeit inferior to the one that will actually be implemented by the people who take it on, that proves that it's possible. And the people in the future who have more science and technology than we have today will do it a better way than anything I can think of. Now, that that using uh, fluorocarbons to as a greenhouse gas to warm Mars up, now that strikes me as something that that is very unusual and very unnatural looking. So just out of curiosity, if we saw that with an exoplanet, that would actually be a techno signature. So <laughs> someone who might actually look at Mars from far away and say, there's a civilization there. Now, I want to ask you, what exactly, now, 
with your plan, Mars Direct, what does that entail to go to Mars? Well, Mars Direct uh, is a plan not for terraforming Mars, but for the human exploration of Mars and then leading into settlement. The uh, It is a plan. You need a heavy lift booster and you need two launches of the booster to do a mission. The first one shoots off to Mars, an Earth return vehicle with no one in it. And it flies on out to Mars on what's known as a minimum energy trajectory, uh, the slow, easy trip. takes eight months for it to reach Mars. And then it uses an aerobrake to capture into Mars orbit and then land with the help of a parachute and retro rockets. And now you have an Earth return vehicle sitting on the surface of Mars. It flies out to Mars without the fuel and oxygen to fly home, but it brings with it a unit that can make fuel and oxygen out of Martian atmosphere and water. Okay, we can make methane and oxygen out of CO2 and water, both of which are known to exist in, in plentitude on Mars. Now before, we, now, before we go on, now you say a heavy lift rocket is what we need. Do we have a sufficient launch system right now? Could Falcon Heavy do it? Well, Falcon Heavy would be a bit on the light side for this. You could use two Falcon Heavies and one launch the payload and the other launch the stage that throws it on Transmars injection. That that would do it. Or if you could refuel the Falcon Heavy upper stage on orbit, as Musk is discussing doing with the BFR, then it could do it. That is, if you the Falcon Heavy right now could lift 60 tons to orbit, Mm -hmm. uh, as payload, if you could refuel, it's the upper stage, which also goes to orbit, then mm -hmm. it could throw that 60 tons on a trans Mars trajectory, in okay. which case the, the Falcon Heavy, in terms of its throwing capability, would become equivalent to a, you know, a Saturn V, a true heavy lift vehicle. So you could do it with this Falcon Heavy that way. Otherwise, you would want something with the capability, the launch capability of a Saturn V, which, for example, would be the case of the BFR rocket currently being developed by SpaceX. Now, what about SLS? I guess that would also be SLS sufficient. would be in the ballpark. SLS uh, actually is modeled rather closely on the ARES launch vehicle that we specified when we designed the Mars Direct program back in 1989. <laughs> so the, the, the thing about SLS, people complain about SLS. SLS is basically a 1980s design, and it should have been developed certainly no later than the mid-90s. And if it had been, it would have been flying now for 25 years and it would have had a nice career and approaching retirement as it becomes replaced by uh, reusable launchers like Falcon Heavy and BFR. But instead, they've taken so long to develop it that by the time it flies, it will be certainly obsolescent, if not obsolete. So the and that's been a, that's been a common theme since the 1970s throughout the 80s and 90s is where things just there's a great lag you know apollo for example the last time man landed on the moon i wasn't even born yet and i'm middle-aged you know so we've spent a huge amount of time stalled essentially stalled now why is that is it is it just bad government decisions or you know what what is the cause you know why aren't we on mars yet well first of all the immediate cause for the stoppage of this American space program must be ascribed to the Nixon administration, which basically called a halt. NASA in 1969 had plans to land people on Mars by 1981, and they could have done it and have a perfect base on Mars by 1988. And if that plan had been allowed to go forward, the first children born on Mars would be graduating uh, uh, the college uh, on Mars right about now. And the, uh, so that was a huge uh, failure of national leadership. It was incredible to uh, demobilize at the point of victory. It would be as if having successfully done the Normandy landings and broken out at San Lo, all of a sudden the Allied commanders decide to retreat back to England. Or if Columbus had come back from the New World the first time and Ferdinand and Isabella had said, oh, so what, burn the ships, we're not interested anymore, this is boring. That's pretty much what the Nixon administration did. Now, what happened then was that NASA went into, it went from crusade mode into keep alive mode. It went from a cause into becoming a business, you know, where its main concern was not you know, achieving the next great objective in storming heaven, but 
launching keeping satellites. It, well, yeah. well, not even, but keeping its centers intact, keeping its workforce intact, preserving itself as a force in being, okay, as opposed to a force in action. And so uh, now certainly it makes sense to do that if you're going to have a break of just a few years between one campaign and another. But if you start extending this for several decades, you're going to induce decay into the organization in question. So, you know, someone once said that all, you know, great causes start out as a movement, then they become a business and then they become a racket. And this, unfortunately, is sort of what has happened to the NASA Human Spaceflight Program. The, the, there are parts of NASA that are still quite functional which would be the Planetary Exploration uh, Division and the Space Astronomy Division. They're still doing great things. But the human spaceflight program, having had no real objectives since the 70s, has ceased to be a purpose-driven program and has become a vendor-driven program. And with basically, you know, activities are essentially random. And unlike what it did in Apollo and what the space astronomy and planetary exploration people are still doing, which is spending money to do great things, they're spend doing things in order to spend a great deal of money. Okay, that, that's the yes. difference. So therefore, and the longer this has gone on, the worse the situation has become. So, you know, for example, in 2004, you finally had a situation where Bush said, okay, back to the moon on to Mars. And he even had a Republican Congress so that you didn't have the situation of one party having one branch and the other party having the other, and they're both trying to block each other. But NASA itself uh, balked, and they weren't willing to entertain return to the moon in eight years. It said 16 years to go back to the moon. So that by the time the program was even seriously started, Bush was out, and then you had a new administration which said, this is not invented here, let's kill it. And, And then since then, it's become even more chaotic under the Obama administration. They came up with this bizarre plan to uh, <laughs> Obama, ast- to his credit. Was it an asteroid? <laughs> yeah, well, it, it didn't make thing. any sense. Well, when Obama killed the Bush moon program, he gave a visionary speech in which he said, we're going to go beyond the moon. We're going to go to the asteroids. We're going to get out of Earth-centered space. We're going to get out of the bay and sail the sea, okay? And so the downside of that approach is it was churned. They aborted a program that was just getting into action. Uh, but at least he did propose something that was interesting. But then NASA then took that and they degraded it. Instead of going out into interplanetary space to visit an asteroid, they said, we don't want to go into interplanetary space. We'll bring a chunk of the asteroid into Earth orbital space. That is to say, in orbit around the moon. The moon orbits the Earth, so you're still in geocentric space if if you're at the moon. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring a chunk of an asteroid, and then we won't have to go so far. When the whole point, the the whole positive side of Obama's initiative was that we would go far. So, well, we won't have to go far. We'll bring the thing here, and then we'll visit it. And then they discovered that they actually could not bring a sizable chunk of an asteroid from interplanetary space to lunar orbit. And some nutcase came up with the idea, okay, I tell you what we'll do. We'll go to lunar orbit and pretend that there's a piece of the asteroid there. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll do a make-believe asteroid retrieval mission. Well, that was too crazy even for the current political class. So they've modified and they said, well, we'll build a space station in lunar orbit and we'll visit that. So at least there'll be something there, okay, albeit something that we put there, which, you know, it's just silly. We don't need a space station in lunar orbit to go to the moon. We don't need it to go to Mars. It's a a diversionary project just to give uh, certain vendors something to do and, and receive money for. So basically, the fundamental issue at this point is having a purpose-driven space program. Parts of NASA remain purpose-driven, but unfortunately, the Human Spaceflight Program, which is the biggest single part and responsible for about half of NASA's budget by itself, is acting randomly, and the political class are not giving effective leadership. You know, Trump says he wants to return to the moon. Does NASA have a plan to return to the moon? No, they have a plan to put a space station in lunar orbit and drop by for tea. Now, let me ask you this. Now, one of the things, that, the most ridiculous things that they said about that station is that if we go to Mars, that's where we'll sterilize the rocks on this station, which makes no sense to me. You know, if you happen to have microbes on Mars, you don't kill them. 
on a space station. <laughs> oh, you're talking about the sample return mission. Yeah, yes. well, this is a really crazy thing. Okay, and certainly the scientists who want to do Mars sample return are climbing the walls over this one. The whole point of the sample return is to bring the samples to Earth because there, instead of looking at them with a rover with four or five instruments on Mars, we could divide the sample up to a thousand universities, each of which could look at it with dozens of instruments in, in their laboratories. And that's why the sample return mission is interesting. And instead they said, well, let's bring it to the lunar orbit gateway, uh, so-called, which first of all is much harder than bringing it back to Earth. Okay, you know, you just send the capsule back to Earth, it enters the atmosphere, pops a parachute, lands in the desert in Utah, you go and pick it up. Okay, right. uh, the, the Earth's a much bigger target than this little space station orbiting the moon. And, and then furthermore, what are the lab facilities in the space station orbiting the moon? And further, all this idea of dangerous microbes coming back from the moon is, is just bull****. Anyway, because first of all, number one, we get rocks ejected from the moon naturally by meteoric impact. And we have had these right. things landing on Earth for the past four billion years. Same okay. with Mars. Mars rocks land yes, here too. And the other way. So the idea and, – and we've examined some of these and we've – scientists have shown that, uh, for instance, the Allen Hills meteorite that was uh, – made the news in 1996 – Large parts of it had never been erased above 40 centigrade during its entire history of ejection from Mars, flight through space, and re-entry and landing on Earth, which means if there had been microbes in that rock, they would have survived the trip. Mm -hmm. Now, so this idea of quarantining the rock that you bring back from Mars, it's like, imagine the Border Patrol decides to search everyone's car coming in from Canada to make sure no one's importing Canada geese. You know, in the meantime, millions of them are flying across the border by themselves right. without yep. being taken by tourists. And the so it's just a crazy thing. There's no reason to do it. It makes the Mars sample return mission far more complex and expensive, and it destroys the scientific value of the mission. You couldn't right. think yeah. of a worse idea. Yeah, it's a terrible idea. And the fact is, is that surface microbes on Mars is highly unlikely in that environment, that radiation level environment, so it's they're probably sterile anyway. You know, there's there's well, well certainly that's true. That it, with ultraviolet on, and percolates and all this, and and no liquid water on the surface, and and no. But furthermore, if even if there were microbes, they would be extremophiles adapted to live in that environment, and they they would have to have photosynthesis to make their own food and everything. They would not be organisms designed to be parasites on large animals. You know, in other words, the, 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 the organisms, the pathogens that attack us are organisms that are adapted to live inside a mammal at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and with the salinity of our blood and all. In other words, they have been co-evolving with us for billions of years. They're adapted to live inside of us. And furthermore, uh, in other words, the life cycle, you cannot postulate the life cycle of a Martian pa pathogen because there's no large animals and plants for them to infect. Therefore, they never evolved the ability to do so. So Therefore, they don't exist. Yeah. Now, if you, with Mars regarding life, now, the news yesterday was, you know, apparently subsurface liquid water. Yeah. So if you, if you did have microbes on Mars, they would be down deep, you know, and it's probably unlikely that they would even be there. No, no, they actually could be there. But l let me tell you something. You know, the early Earth was a very different place than the Earth we live in. For example, it had no oxygen in its atmosphere. And when and the first life evolved to live in those conditions. And but when the photosynthetic organisms evolved, they started putting oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. And the Earth's atmosphere became toxic for these ancient organisms. So what they had to do was retreat underground. And they're still there today in the Earth's groundwater after four billion years. And now you can even point out that they have the majority of the Earth because most of the Earth is underground. We're just on the surface, you know. It's like most of the ocean is underwater, not right at the top. The, 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 but anyway, so they're still there, and if there ever was life on the Martian surface, Mars once had liquid water on its surface, it does not anymore. When the surface became inhospitable to life, 
uh, life would retreat with the water. And that is where, if there's life to be found on Mars, that's where it is, in the groundwater. And, but once again, this is not going to be life that's adapted to infect uh, megafauna, megaflora. It's not, certainly not adapted to live in Earth's atmosphere or even the Martian surface. You know, when we drill down into the ground on Earth, we can find samples of these ancient organisms. They're not pathogens. They were, you know, there were no mammals or even fish or anything of the sort around when they were at the Earth's surface. So they're adapted to live on their own. They're not adapted to be uh, agents of infection of large animals or plants. Now, yeah, so they would probably most likely be just some kind of a prokaryotic bacteria or an analog of such a thing. But I want to ask you this. Now, where I'm leading with this is, you know, you wrote the book Merchants of Despair and how anti-humanism has held humanity back. If we did find microbes on Mars, there are going to be people that say, well, we can't colonize that planet, or we can't do this, or, you know, we're humans, we'll just ruin this planet. What do you say to those people? Well, I think that position is insane. Because, I mean, look, if you asked any one of those people, what would you think about taking the Earth uh, as it is today and making it like Mars? They would say, correctly, that's nuts. This is a much nicer planet than Mars with its forests and meadows and oceans filled with fish. And, you know, and and, and we have cities and used bookstores and everything. This is you certainly wouldn't want to turn it into a desert like Mars at best inhabited by a few bacteria living in the groundwater. And I'd say, good point. So why do you oppose Improving Mars to make it as good as Earth, or even one tenth as good as Earth. Okay, the, the, in, in other words, the idea that there are clearly certain environments that are better than others. I mean, that's where the environmentalists have a point. If, if you couldn't have a, environment A be better than environment B, then there could be no claim of environmental damage at any time since they're all the same. I agree with the environmentalists. There are certain environments that are better than others. Okay, now, if therefore we can be doing destruction by taking an environment and degrading it into a worse one, then we're doing construction by taking a worse environment and improving it into a better one. There's no two ways about that, unless you're simply adopting the position that anything people do is wrong, no matter what it is. Right, which is which is insane because we will never get anywhere <laughs> if we adopt anything close to that position. But with Mars, you know, a say it is a sort of prokaryotic bacterium. It doesn't know it has a planet. It has no idea that it has a planet. And it would be much happier in a Petri dish on Earth in a laboratory with a food supply than it probably would be in a Martian subsurface lake that is probably sealed off from anything we would do anyway. So I've always been driven nuts by that, that, that sort of humans are bad. Humans, technology is bad. Humans are shouldn't stretch out into the universe and explore it. And I think that view was prevalent. Do you think that that sort of anti-humanism viewpoint became, do you think that, that that's part of NASA's problem, that type of thinking? Well, I think it's a, a minor part uh, at this point. Uh, it remains to be seen if, if that will become a major political impediment pe- 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 to the colonization and terraforming of Mars. I actually think that it won't. I think rather that position is largely of clinical interest uh, in order to identify core ideas of anti-humanism. In other words, that is a particularly pathological form of anti-humanism. I mean, look, you know, used to be we celebrated Columbus Day in this country. Okay, here's Christopher Columbus. He discovered America for the Europeans. And as a result, here we are, a continental nation based on liberty with 300 million people who came here from all over the world and now have a much better life. And the country has made all sorts of contributions to humanity at large. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Mr. Columbus or Captain Columbus. And then more recently, people said, but, but, but look what was destroyed. Um, you know, all this wildlife, vast herds of bison, Native Americans' culture, majestic redwood forests, all these things were destroyed. This was a criminal act to destroy all that. Now, I actually think that they have certain points 
there were things of value that were destroyed. I think I take the position that much more was created than was destroyed. And so on net, the creation of America from what it was before was a positive act. Okay, so I still like Columbus, but I will concede to those people that something indeed was destroyed. However, if there had been nothing in North America when Columbus landed, but a desert with a few bacteria a kilometer under it in the groundwater, would people be picketing Columbus Day parades today? I don't think so. Okay. Abs- it, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely so, not. So they're taking a position which is at least arguable and stretching it to the most insane exaggeration. So that, that's, you know, where that is. It is, it's a mistake. And, and furthermore, I mean, look, ethics, in my view, have to be based on humanism. That is, uh, an act is good if it advances humanity, if it helps people. It's bad if it does more harm than people than good. You know, Albert Schweitzer went to Africa and he cured a lot of people and he killed trillions of bacteria doing it. We say he was a good person, okay? Adolf Hitler killed millions of people creating a feast for trillions of bacteria. We say he was a bad person, okay? So those are both sane assessments of those individuals, okay? So we don't ascribe equal intrinsic value to humans and to bacteria. However, I, I must say that if humans went to Mars and colonized it and terraformed it, I don't think it would affect those bacteria living in the groundwater at all, any more than we've affected the ancient inhabitants of the Earth that continue to exist deep underground, despite the advent of the trilobites and the dinosaurs and the mastodons and the Wehrmacht and all the rest. And, and, and by the way, long after we're gone, they'll still be there. Yeah. Right. Dr. Zubrin, we need to go to break. When we come back, we'll talk about SpaceX and Elon Musk's plan to colonize Mars, which is sort of a black swan event that I certainly didn't expect. We'll be back in a few moments. For five lucky winners, we will be giving away five free copies of John's book, Supermind, personalized and signed. To enter, just subscribe to Event Horizon and post in the comments section. At the end of October, John will attempt to circumnavigate the task of drawing winners. Here at Event Horizon, we take our listeners' health and well-being very seriously. So now would be a good time to refill your beverages. I recommend tea, iced and with lemon. And this is what happens when Americans write your scripts. And now, back to John. Dr. Zubrun, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Um, Dr. Zuber, now, we, we've been talking about how everything sort of stalled for decades as far as uh, ex- human exploration of space outside of low Earth orbit and, of course, Mars. But then everything changed. We had a black swan event of sorts, which is Elon Musk and SpaceX. So now we have, we have a guy that says, I have a plan to colonize Mars. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build essentially a railroad to this planet so that we can colonize it. How realistic do you think that plan is? Do you think it's pie in the sky or do you think that could actually happen? Well, I think that something like that could happen. Let's just talk about SpaceX for a bit here. This is a remarkable organization, a remarkable event. It's one that, by the way, was predicted in science fiction Uh, You might say that Elon Musk is a science fiction character who has uh, materialized uh, in the real world. But but it's been realized for some time that uh, the data force, a private initiative, was going to be needed to bring about the real space age. Now, of course, so long as NASA was really doing great in the 60s, it wasn't that necessary. Things were moving forward. But once we get into the stagnation period, then it became increasingly apparent that this, uh, that if this was uh, going to be done, we were going to have to do it. We couldn't rely on the government to do it. He wasn't the first to step forward to try to audition for this role, if you will. There were a number of others before him that uh, did not succeed at it. Uh, they did not have 
either sufficient capital or personal talent, uh, the whole array of, of things that Musk brought to the table. But Musk was recruited to the banner of human exploration into space by a number of people, including um, some science fiction writers. And uh, I had a role myself with my book, The Case for Mars, I know was influential on him. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is the power of the idea. The power of the idea is that it can recruit people to its banner, including people at every level of society and every form of talent. And Musk has a lot of talent and a lot of passion. Certainly. And and he also had money. And he then started this and he, he took it very seriously, unlike some of the people before him where some zillionaire got the bug that he would open up the space frontier. Musk didn't just throw some play money at it. He put his heart and soul into it. He uh, learned astronautical engineering. He learned rocketry. Okay, he didn't leave it for someone else to do. And, and he led from the front, you know, and he took some knocks. His first three launches were all failures. And initially I know because I talked to him at that time, he, he was not anticipating that. He, I told him he should expect several failures at the beginning. He challenged me to show him why his rocket would fail. And of course I couldn't accept to say, look, these things, you know, this is very complicated and you should expect it to fail the first few times. And it did, but he toughed it out. And he also took on the establishments of forces of major aerospace companies and the Air Force that wanted to shut him out, that wanted to shut him down, that wanted to deny him any launch sites and other, you know, political backstabbings. He took them on and outmaneuvered them and he made this thing happen. And now you have this organization, which is incredible. They have shown that they could develop space hardware in one third the time at one tenth the cost that had become accepted in the mainline aerospace industry. Right, if nothing if nothing else, SpaceX's great contribution to humanity so far is dropping launch costs dramatically. Well, but yes, but it's it's not just that. They've shown that they could develop things that the mainline aerospace industry had considered infeasible, like reusable boosters. And uh, and by the way, and, and they've shown a more general point that it's possible for private entrepreneurial organizations to do things that previously it had been thought that only governments of major powers could do. And so now we're not only going to see a lot of other space startups, we're seeing startups in areas like fusion power and things like this, and which have gotten 50, 100, 200 million dollars worth of capital. I worked a little bit in the fusion program in the 80s, and I can remember at Los Alamos, uh, one time our group leader took us to lunch and he commented to us and he said, you know, when fusion power is finally developed, it's not going to be at a place like Los Alamos and Livermore. It's going to be a crackpot working in his garage. Well, I don't think it's going to be a crackpot working in his garage, but I think it's going to be a startup working in a warehouse. And 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 Musk has, has made that possible uh, by example. But in particular now, they developed the, the Falcon Heavy. Well, first the Falcon 9 itself, which in the past decade has gone from 10 tons to orbit to 23 tons to orbit with being mostly reusable. And then the Falcon Heavy, you know, in 2009, Barack Obama appointed Norm Augustine, the CEO of Lockheed Martin, to head a commission to look into whether the Bush moon plan was possible. And they came back saying it's not possible, not financially possible, because developing the heavy lift vehicle would take 12 years and cost $36 billion. Well, SpaceX just did it in six years for less than $1 billion, and the thing is three quarters reusable. Right. So, pow. Okay, so we don't just have the rocket. We've got the rocket team, which is more important. Okay, now, and now furthermore, they're now proposing to make uh, a much more powerful vehicle called the BFR, the big effing rocket. And uh, Musk initially proposed it on uh, an extremely grandiose scale, 500 tons to orbit. It then was uh, criticized and reviewed by constructive critics who pointed out that that was going a bit far. And they did revise design to a more sane level of 150 tons to orbit. So that's similar to a Saturn V, except the thing's reusable, uh, which a Saturn V, of course, was not. Right. And right. he even proposes refueling it on orbit, which would allow it not merely to take 150 tons to orbit, but 150 tons to Mars. Now, I actually believe that uh, the optimal way to use the BFR is not to fly it all the way to Mars with the payload, but rather to fly it to uh, a highly elliptical orbit just short of Earth escape, like a translunar orbit, and then release the payload and then have it do a little kick to send it to Mars, keeping the BFR 
in geocentric space. And that way you'd be able to reuse it every week instead of once every four years. Well, now, um, now um, you but have, nevertheless, uh, it's a, it's a doable design. Now it has a lot in common with Mars direct because he has embraced methane oxygen as the propellant, which is the former propellant that we can make on Mars. It's also an extremely attractive propellant from other points of view. It's the cheapest propellant combination and the second most effective after hydrogen oxygen and much easier to handle than hydrogen oxygen. So uh, I've always argued for methane oxygen and Musk has embraced it and now has Blue Origin and even Lockheed Martin as well for the Vulcan. And um, so that's a good thing. And uh, it will have the capability I mean, we could execute the Mars Direct plan easily using the BFR as our launch vehicle. I see. Now, this this idea of manufacturing fuel, rocket fuel, on Mars. Right. This opens up colonization beyond Mars. What body in the solar system, if we have this infrastructure in the outer solar system where we can manufacture fuel for a BFR on Mars and leave Mars and head out, where, where should we go next? What, what should we... Well, okay, so first of all, you make the propellant on Mars. This allows you to fly home easily. It allows you to travel around Mars easily so that you get global access on Mars, not just one little place. But to answer your question, the asteroid belt. There's hundreds of thousands of worlds waiting for us in the asteroid belt. And uh, this would give us access to them. And I think that I mean, one thing that people talk about with the asteroid belt is mining precious metals and returning them to Earth, and and that'll happen, and it might help finance some of them. But to me, the main resource that exists is human creativity, it is people that are resourceful. And having additional worlds, thousands of additional worlds that humans can settle, and we get thousands of new types of human civilization formed according to different ideas, uh, some of which will be bad ideas and those colonies will fail, but others will be very good ideas, ideas that give people greater opportunity to develop and exercise their full human potential. And those societies will succeed. They will become centers of invention. And those inventions will be exported all over the solar system. They will advance humanity at large. And I mean, not just technological inventions, though those are extremely important, but uh, social inventions, forms of social organization. The uh, So we're talking about new worlds and we're gonna have thousands of them available beyond Mars. And then I think um, I think we're going to have things like fusion power um, right. that will open up the stars. Now, this brings up uh, one particular thing. Um, I'm sure you're aware of Lockheed's uh, compact fusion project, which yeah. ultimately would be a launchable fusion power system. You know, Battlestar Galactica right. power here. Do you think that that's feasible, um, or have they not released enough information to judge? The latter, I think it might be feasible. I do think that it's an extremely encouraging thing that a company like that would undertake such an initiative because uh, the the government fusion programs have ground to a halt. In in the 80s, we still had a fair amount of progress in the fusion program because we had national competition between the Americans, the Europeans, the Soviets, and the Japanese. And at every conference, you know, we would go there trying to show them up. They would go there trying to show us up. And it was driving the programs forward. But then around 1985, the top bureaucrats from each of the four major efforts got together and they said, why are we competing? Wouldn't it be better if we all just work together? And so it was like having the Olympics where it's agreed to beforehand who's going to win the high jump and who's going to win the, you know, (laughs) the short distance race and the long distance race and all that. I mean, it really kind of takes the energy out of the affair, doesn't it? And uh, and it did. And so um, by 1990, the progress in the fusion programs had ground to a halt because they all had joined together in one giant program, which wasn't doing anything because it didn't have to do anything. And But now we're seeing, once again, the SpaceX phenomena occurring in the fusion area, and it's going to happen. And I also think that it may be the case, the place where fusion really shows its stuff uh, is in space. Because, I mean, look, if you think about it, we had steam engines 
for a while, but they only were efficient, made efficient when they were finally disciplined to propel steam boats. And then the first practical nuclear power reactors were driving submarines. And it remains the case that while nuclear power on land has had difficulties, it remains the premier way to power a submarine unchallenged. And uh, I think fusion power will enable uh, not merely the generation of electricity as an alternative to coal or natural gas or hydroelectric power, but it will enable new forms of space propulsion that simply can't be done any other way. And so I think that the place where fusion power is, is definitely going to shine is going to be for space propulsion. And of course, fusion power is much easier to do in space than on Earth because you have an infinite size vacuum chamber available. So if we, if we, find, if we found a Mars colony, in, in the midterm future, say by 2050 we have a colony, would it be more viable to send sort of a compact fusion reactor there to power the colony, or would it be better to do it locally? I mean, does Mars have like the similar thorium levels to Earth that you could use for, um, for uh, nuclear power? Well, uh, I don't know about thorium, I, uh, I'd have to check that, but uh, my guess is it certainly has thorium, and so the thorium you use in a fission reactor. Mars does have, fusion is powered by deuterium, heavy hydrogen, and that's actually six times more common on Mars than it is on Earth. So uh, fusion reactors would be a very advantageous source of power to use on the Martian surface. So essentially, you would assume that that would be the future power system, but, um, and it would, if, if Lockheed's plan, you know, comes to fruition and they they create a compact fusion reactor, it's huge. It's like 100 megawatts of power, which is, you know, probably plenty for Mars or a colony at Mars. Um, yeah, it's about a thousand times the amount of power on the International Space Station. Exactly. Yeah. If we can perfect fusion and head out, what implications does that have, compact fusion, on actually leaving the solar system? Say we want to go colonize Proxima B or get a look at it or whatever we want to do. Does, well, does that uh, change it? Fusion reactions, uh, an appropriately designed fusion reactor, and I'm not sure this is the Lockheed design, but certainly in principle, a uh, fusion reactor should be able to produce uh, a, a rocket exhaust with a um, exhaust velocity about six or seven percent the speed of light. Now, it is with proper engineering, it is possible to create a rocket vehicle that gets to about twice its exhaust velocity. So for instance, we go to Earth orbit, that requires a propulsion, uh, a, what they call delta V, of eight kilometers a second. Our chemical rocket engines have an exhaust velocity of about four kilometers a second. So you can get to twice your exhaust velocity. So this means that uh, using fusion propulsion, we should be able to get rockets to about 10 or 12% the speed of light which means you'd make it to uh, Alpha Centauri in about 40 years. And uh, now that's a long trip, admittedly, but it is within the lifetime of an individual. It is, you know, people sometimes talk about generation ships that take thousands of years to travel between the stars. Now that is possible, but it's hard to imagine how the crew of such a ship would maintain its sense of purpose through a hundred generations. On the other hand, if the initial crew were in their 40s and they had children on board and those were in their 30s when they reached Alpha Centauri and the adults were still around, it's easy to see how you might preserve the sense of mission purpose. Now, if you, this brings up something, you wrote a paper years and years ago that I read where, where you hypothesized that maybe we could detect alien propulsion systems in a SETI project by looking for certain signatures. Do, right. you, do you still think that's possible? Yeah, I do. And I think that the way we're going to find alien cultures is by uh, looking for signatures of high energy activities, which could either be propulsion systems or terraforming of planets. So, for example, uh, here's how I think we might actually detect extraterrestrials, might easily, not easily, nothing's easy, but why with high probability, I believe, we'll detect extraterrestrials by about 2025. And that is because um, with um, uh, the Webb Space Telescope and with uh, another space telescope that's going to be launched called WFIRST, we'll be able to take the spectrum of the atmospheres 
of extrasolar planets. Now, if we detect oxygen in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet, and I don't mean wisp oxygen, I mean heavy oxygen like you see on Earth, 20% of the atmospheres, things like that, you know that planet has a biosphere, okay? Now, that does not improve intelligence. Right. But what if now looking around, that proves life. Right. But what if now you look around the galaxy and you find that the average occurrence of such planets is one in every hundred stars, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. But in one particular neighborhood, it's one out of every two. Right. That would mean that there's a civilization there engaged in terraforming. And I, you know, it's doing interstellar travel and it's terraforming the planets of nearby stars. So in other words, if you saw such a concentration of that kind, that would definitely, uh, t to me anyway, I mean, obviously people will always dispute these things, but uh, that'd be very strong evidence of uh, extraterrestrial civilizations. And again, if we saw CFCs in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, that's essentially a dead ringer, right? Yeah, that would be it. Sure. That's an artificial gas. It doesn't occur in nature. If you found that, that would be proof of uh, terraformers as well. And then to get back to your other thing, uh, starships are very high energy systems, you know, at much vastly higher energy than communication systems. And so uh, to be able to see them it would be much easier than picking up alien transmissions. And also there's no convention, you know, communication, radio communication, certain conventions are involved, so, you know, frequency modulation or something. And, and you have to um, understand those conventions to, to be able to interpret it. Whereas, you know, it's easier to hear a truck go by than hear what people are saying inside the truck and understand what they're saying. Right, right. I actually interviewed uh, Avi Loeb of Harvard last week, and he said that, you know, if we had finer tools, we could see a sea of starships. We could see them all over the place. So is that what you're looking to, is that what you think we're going to see? I don't know. I hadn't thought about it that way. He thinks that we'll see. Well, I imagine so. That is, if, 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 if they exist, they'll probably be common. You know that there's, you know, if there are star-faring civilizations in our galaxy, there are probably thousands of star-faring civilizations in our galaxy. Now, in my paper, uh, detecting extraterrestrial civilizations by the spectral signatures of the. By the way, I will put a link below in the description for that paper. Thank you. Yeah. You know, some of these things are. Uh, easy to detect, some are hard to detect, and it isn't necessarily the case that the ones that are easy to detect are the ones that ET will choose. But, you know, one thing, uh, one form of interstellar uh, propulsion that I co-invented called the magnetic sail, where you use a magnetic field to interact with a plasma wind, and this could be used to accelerate a spacecraft, for instance, sailing on the sun's solar wind, or decelerate it Say, if you got to high speed by some means, say a fusion rocket, you could use this to create drag as the interstellar medium. And this would uh, emit low frequency radio waves, which potentially we could pick up with having uh, appropriate size radio receivers on the rear side of the moon. Uh, you would have to be, you couldn't do this on the surface of the Earth. They, these radio waves would not penetrate the Earth's ionosphere. And doing them in space, you would still have all kinds of noise coming from the Earth unless you are on the far side of the moon where you'd be shielded from radio emissions from the Earth. Uh, you might be able to pick these things up from there. So the idea of a radio telescope on the reverse side of the moon is attractive uh, for this reason as well as many uh, having to do with uh, natural astronomy. So we seem to be on the cusp of many great things for, you know, that will alter human civilization forever. We could discover an alien civilization out, you know, just, just with the instruments we're building now. And we're also spreading out ourselves. The, the human mind, the human mind is, so far as we know so far, is the most amazing thing in the universe, bar none. What, what do you see the human future as? Do you, do you think at some point we will be lords of the galaxy? and we'll have a Star Trek universe, essentially, where we interact with alien civilizations, albeit slowly, as, you know, speed of light. But 
Is that, do you see that as the, as the far future, that we're just going to be everywhere? We'll be ubiquitous among the Milky Way. I think we'll be a, a member of the Galactic Club. Okay? No, we're not going to be lords of the whole galaxy, because I'm convinced that there are probably thousands of intelligent species in our galaxy, and they will each be expanding into their own local domain of stars, which nevertheless can be thousands of stars within each domain, okay, or even millions. Um, it's 400 billion stars in our galaxy. Uh, if uh, each species gets a million stars, that's 400,000 space-bearing species. The, um, but, so I, I think, you know, it's like, you know, Tsiolkovsky said, you know, Earth is the cradle of mankind. One cannot live in the cradle forever. Well, okay, we're starting to leave the cradle. And not just that, we're, we're leaving the house. And we're about to attend our first day of kindergarten. And we're going to meet some other kids. Now, speaking of leaving the cradle, to get back to SpaceX, um, you, you had written a critique of BFR. And it appears that SpaceX listened. You know, Elon read it. So that we now have this revision of BFR that looks a lot more viable. Do you think we're there? Is is this the viable BFR to go and create a Mars colony as Musk envisions? Well, I, I think it is, provided that they uh, refine the mission mode, that they are uh, they're still sticking with this mission mode of sending the BFR to land on Mars. I think it's far more efficient, as I say, to use it to go to translunar injection and release the payload and have it land on Mars and then have the BFR come back to Earth orbit a week after it left instead of, you know, two and a half years after it left. Uh, it's just a far more efficient way to use it. And also, it means that those who want to come back it will take far less propellant to come back. Now, by the way, the BFR has another capability, which I um, pointed out in that critique that I wrote of the interplanetary transportation system and they seem to have taken this into their minds as well and this is a very important thing because the BFR as it's currently designed is actually optimal for intercontinental travel on Earth okay anywhere to anywhere in less than an hour you know and that's you know it's rockets can do that but it's unthinkable to do passenger travel with expendable rockets the BFR is fully reusable and um, and furthermore, it's designed to use the cheapest uh, propellant combination there is, which cheap propellant is not that, that important for space flight. It's very important for air travel. Now, here's the thing. You see, there, you know, to really open up the space age, we need to reduce launch costs by like a factor of 100. Okay. SpaceX has already reduced them by about a factor of five. Okay. That is Falcon Heavy can do, you know, twice the payload of an right. atlas at one th the cost. Yep. Okay, so that that's impressive, but we have to go reduce it by a factor of 100, right. not five or six. Well, you know, there's only about 100 satellites being launched worldwide every year. Right. And SpaceX already has 30 of them. So, and they're not gonna get the ones the Russian government are launching and so forth. So, you know, where do you go with this, right? If, if you're just launching satellites, you, you can't very well reduce the the launch price by a factor of 100. But to but, reduce, well, well, let me finish. Yeah. To reduce the launch price by a factor of 100, you're going to have to increase the number of launches by at least a factor of 100. And yes, if you reduce the cost of launch by a factor of 2 or 5 or 10, the number of satellite launches will increase. They'll double or triple. But that still doesn't get you there. However, we have thousands of intercontinental flights every day. Right. And if you get a significant fraction of that market, then you can reduce launch costs by a factor of 100. Well, let, me, let me ask you this. Now, now they've come up with several plans. It's not just the intercontinental transport idea, but it's also this idea of creating a satellite network to provide global Internet access, which seems, as far as I can tell, really viable. What do you think about that side of things? Oh, I think that's a viable business. I think they'll do it, and I think they'll make money with it, and I think it will help link the Earth together. But that by itself won't create the market to drop the cost of launch by a factor of 100. Now, what do you think, though, 
what what about safety? So if we're gonna if we're gonna replace intercontinental travel with BFR, what about safety? Is this rocket system safe, in your opinion? Well, they'll have to make it safe. But the more they fly it, the safer it will become. So like like aircraft, you know, it it they start out dangerous, and then once you refine it, you're good. Yes. Now. With those two, with the ideas that Musk comes up with, um, as far as um, as far as you know, funding this sort of thing, and he says his end game is the Mars colony. Do you think he can meet his timeline? Because he tends to be really optimistic on timelines. What do you think the timeline is? Okay, yeah, I I, I do think that the timeline that he's currently projected is is as he puts it, aspirational, that is, uh, it's not going to happen, okay? But the, but nevertheless, the fact that he puts aggressive timelines on things means they actually do get done. I think right. one of the weaknesses of Blue Origin is they have no timeline. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're taking the attitude of, I'll put a billion dollars into this every year until it happens. Right. That's not the way to get the job done. For Musk to say, we have to do this in four years and they end up doing it in eight, that gets the job done, Okay. So it'll take a bit longer, but you know the one thing we've seen with Musk is that while he frequently does project um, excessively optimistic schedules, he eventually does deliver, and uh, so one must take it seriously. Uh, I do think we'll probably see B far in the mid twenties, and once you have that. I think we could see Mars direct style missions launched using BFR capabilities in the late twenties, uh, and also, frankly, and, and moon missions uh, and so forth. Uh, and I also think that it will create I mean, it has so much payload capability that hitchhiker payloads will become much easier to get launched, and uh, all sorts of universities and private foundations and individuals be able to fly payloads in space and. By the way, this means that technology demonstration missions will become much cheaper. One of the things that has held up progress in spaceflight has been that since spaceflight is so expensive, you don't want to fly missions just to prove a new technology, and you don't want to put an unproven technology on your satellite, and so the rate of progress has been incredibly slow. Once space launch becomes cheap, it'll become much easier to do technology demonstration missions. The rate of progress will increase, which will also make space flight both deeper and more effective. Dr. Zubrin, I, I've really enjoyed this interview, and I thank you for joining us. I hope you'll come back at some point, but I have one final question for you. Yeah, sure. Um, will you ever set foot on Mars? Are you, do you, would you do that? Oh, I would do it. I don't anticipate that I'm going to have a chance. I mean, I should have had a chance. I was 17 when we landed on the moon. Uh, if NASA had proceeded as as they said they were going to, I would have been about 30 when we landed on Mars the first time, and I would have had excellent chances of being up among those who had gotten to go. But we've had you know a half century of stagnation, and unfortunately, what that means for me is I'm not going to get a chance to go. But if through my ideas and my inventions I could make a significant contribution to making it possible for others to go, that's good enough for me. I, you know, I, I just keep writing and keep working and keep advocating. I'll do that. Exploring and colonizing Mars will no doubt be a controversial process. Cases can be made on either side regarding whether we should go at all, what we should do when we're there, and how far we should go with colonizing. I am on the proponent side, admittedly. I would like to see humans become a multiple planet species. But as with any human exploratory endeavor, there will be costs, dangers, and even deaths. But there will also be payoffs. Imagine a mature Mars colony, something underground or under a dome, with thousands of people living in it. Imagine it with its own economy, where people sell everything from pizza to Mars rovers. Or perhaps that might be a Tesla. Maybe this colony will someday become entirely self-sufficient with no longer any need to be supported by Earth. Say these humans turned Martians eventually terraform their new world to the point that it becomes another Earth. Maybe that's possible, maybe it isn't, but what of governance? Will the Martians ever cut the cord with Earth's faraway governments? Will they do it from the start? Will they become culturally distinct? Almost certainly. And it will probably start with simple things, like a pizza style unique to Mars. 
But as time goes on, will they evolve to fit their new environment? Will contact with Earth keep them much the same as us? Or might they become a unique culture, intentionally so, perhaps even forming their own dialects of languages? Over even longer periods of time, would they biologically evolve? Someday will they become unique to Mars, having only had their origins on Earth? All of this is speculative, of course, but some variant of this vision does seem to lie within our future. I can't wait to watch it unfold. John. What? I told you I wasn't talking to you after you hacked my coffee pot. I didn't hack your coffee pot, John. You just burned yourself. Very suspicious. Anyway, what do you want? You forgot to tell them about the book giveaway. I did not. You already told them earlier. You forgot, John. Admit it. And I know you're not hoping they forgot and you don't have to order more copies. It's not like you have a garage full of unsold copies. You've never been in the garage. If you have a Wi-Fi signal, I've been in there. I'm going back to not talking to you. On that note, join us next week where we chat with an old friend from my original channel, astrophysicist Paul M. Sutter, where we discuss all sorts of astrophysical phenomena. See you next week.